Okay, so uh, we'll start in a minute. Okay, let's begin. So we're going to continue with our series on recurrent neural networks. And today's topics are stability analysis, and we're going to introduce the notion of gated uh, recurrent neural networks. Now, we've seen so far that networks with iterated structure, which scan the input by looking at the current and past inputs are good for analyzing time series data, specifically time series data with short time dependence on the past. So these are the so-called time delay neural networks or 1D convents. But these are not good for analyzing inputs with long-term dependencies. So to analyze inputs with uh, long-term dependencies, we will need recurrent structures, models that refer to their own internal variables from the past, like the one over here. So these are recurrent neural networks. Now, recurrent neural networks aren't good only for analyzing time series data. In fact, they end up being ap applicable to other problems that are apparently ML MLP problems, problems that have to be solved that look like uh, they are intended for multilayer perceptrons. So consider, for instance, the problem of adding two n bit numbers. So if I want to compose a multilayer perceptron, which takes in two n bit numbers and outputs the result in binary, so that the numbers are represented in binary. Now, in this case, the total, the, the uh, total size of the input is two n. The output is n plus one. So the size of the output is n plus one because when you add two n bit numbers, the output is going to have n plus one bits. And if you want to compose a static multilayer perceptron, which can perform this operation, which takes in two bit sequences and outputs their sum, how large must this MLP be? Does anybody want to guess? Two to the power n. Approximately, I mean, you can you can be far more efficient than that, but it ends up being it, it ends up being very large. Uh, if you were, it's, so if you were naive about it, it can end up being exponentially large because uh, you have to uh, account for every possible combination of these two inputs. Now, suppose I gave you the network with the right structure and I wanted you to train the network, how much data would you require? Two to the power two n. Two to the power two n. You're gonna to have to see all of the pairs if you want to train this network. On the other hand, I can do this with a recurrent model. Instead of adding just, and of course, this network has a problem. If you train a network by adding two n bit numbers, it's not going to add two n plus one bit number, n plus one bit numbers. But now I can do this using recurrent networks. I will add this one bit at a time. And now when I add this one bit at a time, the, the, really uh, the task you end up, end, end up with becomes very, it becomes very simple, right? You have these two inputs, x1, x2. And when you add the two bits, you're going to have an out, output of O and a carry C. So when there's zero and zero, the output is zero, the carry is also zero. When there's zero and one, the output is one, the carry is zero. When this is one and zero, the output is zero, one, the carry is zero. When this is one and one, the output is zero and the carry is one, right? So uh, you just have to learn a simple network which just performs, just learns this little table. And uh, then you can make the whole thing recurrent so that you add the numbers one bit at a time. How large is this circuit going to be? Anyone? How, la how, how large bits. is the circuit going to be? It's going to be a four, four or five units, no more, right? And if you want to train this, how much data do you need? Four pairs. You're going to need about 16 or 17, all these pairs. You're just going to need all of these pairs, right? You're going to need four inputs in the best case, as opposed, and not only can this, does the, is this network much smaller, not only does it require much lesser data, it also generalizes. 
instead of being able to add only n bit numbers, now it can also add numbers of any length. Same thing with the parity problem. If I want to compute the parity of a bit string, and if I want to fix, but for, I want to compose a fixed size MLP for this, how large is this MLP going to be? Anyone? We've done this in the class. How large is this going to be? I think two to the power n again. Again, it's going to be two to the power n. So we saw this in the class. So it's two to the power n minus one. This is an XOR, right? The parity problem is an XOR. It's, it's a complex network. And if I want to train it, how many patterns does it need to see? Two to the power n. Again, two to the power, you know, two to the power n minus one, or two to the power n in this case. So, but I can do this with a recurrent network, which just takes one unit. And all it does is you're going to, the network is going to have one recurrent unit. It takes in, which will have three neurons. It takes in the previous output and the current bit and produces the next output. And if you just make this operation recurrent, the single unit with a very small number of neurons can compute the parity. And, it, and even if you don't hard code the, the, the weights and if you learn them from data, it's going to need very little data to train. And so what we have is that, is that problems that are, why do I need to ask you? There is a poll for this. Ten seconds, guys. Why? Most of you aren't paying attention to class. There are one thing I observe is that the attendance has been going down regularly. We had two hundred people in the first class. Now it's ninety-eight, and uh, I have the freedom to decide which classes I will consider for counting your attendance. And from the looks of it, it looks like I'm going to have to begin counting attendance starting today and ignoring, ignoring everything that happened in the past. So, uh, uh, you know, just to keep you, make sure that you people actually attend. Anyway, the, uh, this is obviously true, right? Now, and so uh, what we find is that Recurrent networks are not just simple, you know, meant only for training uh, recurrent models, right? They can be, uh, they can also deal with other kinds of problems. Now, we also saw in the last class that when you want to train recurrent models, we do this by minimizing the divergence between the actual output sequence produced by the network and the desired output sequence produced by the network. We train this using gradient descent and back propagation. So all of this is something that we've already seen in the class. Maybe we saw one little bit extra today that RNNs can, are actually very versatile and can do a whole lot more than, than analysis of series data. Now, returning to our old model, this is a finite response model. We call this a finite response model. Does anybody remember uh, why we call this a finite response model? Have finite inputs. An input at any time is going to produce an output for only a finite amount of time, right? So this is the time delay network. Now in this model, if I assume that the input values are always bounded, so there's a maximum value for all of the inputs. And furthermore, if I have assumed that all of the activations of the neurons, activation functions are, have, uh, do not grow exponentially. 
that there's an upper limit to how fast they grow. And if I assume that the weights are all bounded, then is there any condition under which the output of this network can blow up and become infinite for any input? Is there any input which will make the output infinite? Anyone? No. It cannot, right? Everything is bounded. All the X's are bounded, all the weights are bounded, the activations never have infinite slope. And so no matter what you feed it, the output is going to be bounded. So this network has something called Bible stability. If the input is bounded, the output is bounded. It's bounded input, bounded output stability. This is a highly desirable characteristic that we always require in our networks for them. Now consider this network. This is a recurrent network. Is this Bible? Is it, does it have by bounded input, bounded output uh, characteristic? No. No. It doesn't, it can, it can keep building up and building up, right? Of course, you have to be a little careful when you say this. If all the activations are inherently bounded, for example, if all the activation functions are sigmoid activations, then the output of any activation is, is up, you know, is, has a ceiling value of one and the network output cannot blow up. It's going to hit the ceiling. But what can happen over here is that it can saturate and become uninformative. The output is always one, which is just as bad. So the question to ask over here is this here is, are there conditions where the network will simply saturate and stay there regardless of further input? Now, analyze, analyzing that with nonlinear activations is kind of hard. So let's consider linear activations. If, there are li if all of the activation functions are linear, so not tan H, not sigmoid, not, but just a straight line, right? Under that condition, does this have bounded input, bounded output characteristic? And if it does, when? And if it doesn't, when not, right? So uh, to analyze this, observe that the actual recurrence only occurs in this hidden layer, right? This layer is the only one that actually has the recurrence. So we only need to analyze this layer. And if this layer blows up, if the outputs of this layer blow up, the output of the network is going to blow up. If they don't blow up, there is uh, the, then the output is not going to blow up. So we're gonna analyze that and specifically, now the typical network with, with nonlinear activations is a complex nonlinear recurrent function and analyzing it is difficult. So uh, what we will do is we will use the familiar streetlight effect, which we did to, which we used to analyze uh, uh, the, the convergence of gradient descent, if you remember. And that is, we're going to analyze models that are tractable. And then we're going to try to translate the inferences that we make from it into more complex models. Here specifically, we know how to analyze linear systems. So to understand the behavior of recurrence, we're going to analyze a linear recurrent system and extrapolate our findings to nonlinear systems. In a linear system, the activation function for all of these guys is just an identity function. And so, we have the affine value at any neuron is simply going to be a weighted sum. We are speaking only of the recurrent layer here, right? So the affine value at any time t is a weighted sum of the hidden, hidden uh, state value at the previous time and the current input. I'm ignoring the bias, but adding the bias will not change the analysis. And the activation itself is just linear. So the output at ht is simply equal to zt. Now, let's expand this recurrence, right? So does everybody see what I'm doing over here? We're analyzing a network where the, where the, uh, where the hidden layer, the, the recurrent layer only has a linear activation. So is this clear? Okay. Now let's expand the recurrence, right? I can write using that equation hk as wh hk minus one plus this term. 
But then if I expand HK minus one, which is this guy, this term here, is it a 10? Yeah. So if I, if, I, if I expand this one, HK minus one is WH times HK minus two plus WX times XK minus one, right? I'm just writing the same formula one time step earlier. So let me insert this term out here. And when I do that, this is the equation I'm going to get, right? So HK is, I've just plugged in the value for HK here, WH times WH times HK minus two, that's WX squared X, HK minus two, plus WH times WX times XK minus one, plus the stuff, WX, XK. And so now I've written HK in terms of HK minus two. But then again, I can write HK minus two as WH, HK, HK minus three times plus WX times XK minus two, right? And so if I plug this value out here, this result is going to be HK equals W, H cubed, HK minus three, it's WX squared times WH times HK minus three, right? HK minus three plus WH squared, WX, XK minus two plus this term plus this term. So I can keep, exp and then I can expand HK minus three and plug that into the formula, I can keep expanding it backward and expressing HK in terms of farther and farther uh, hidden state values, recurrent values until I get all the way to the beginning of time. And that is going to give me this formula over here, which says that the, uh, which says here that uh, the hidden state value at any time is, simply WH, this is the recurrent weight raised to K minus one times the initial value of the state plus WHK times WX times X zero. This is the zero sample of the zero input plus you get the series, right? Now I'm going to sort of simplify this. So does everybody see how this, see where this came from? Questions here? I'm going to use this for the entire analysis. So this is important, any questions? Is this clear, yes or no? Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. okay, now consider the case where I have X zero equals one and X T equals zero for T not equal to one. And furthermore, assume that H minus one equals zero, right? So this, then what is HK going to be? So HK, in this case, this is a situation where I have, I have an input only at, I have an input only at time zero and no further inputs. If I have an input, or I can just call this X zero, I have some value X zero, right? So I have no further inputs. So what is the response at, time k going to be. Now, I'm going to rep represent this as h k of x zero. So this is the response at time k when the input consists of a single value at time zero and all other values are zero. Similarly, if only x one had a non-zero value and all of these guys were all zero, then the output is going to be just this term because all the other terms are going to become zero, right? So I'm going to re represent that as HK. This is the output at time K when I have an input at time one. So is this notation, notation clear to everybody? Is this notation making sense? Yes or no? So basically at t is equal to zero, the input will be x zero, right? The t is equal to Yeah, one. so this is, I'm generally going to write hk of xt. And this means that I have one single non-zero value input at time t. And when that and all other inputs are zero, if that happens, what is the response at time k, right? Okay. And, and what you will observe, so what you will observe over here 
is that if I have a continuous sequence of inputs, then this is the same as you know the response for the input at response to the initial value plus the response to having just a single input at time zero and nothing else, plus the response to having just a single input at time one, plus the response to the input at time two, and so on, right? So this uh, over here, I can further write because if I'm assuming that this is a I'm, because this is a linear system, and if I assume that everything is scalar, so here I'm speaking of a scalar system of where all values are scalars. In that case, I can just pull out the x zero simply because this is a scalar value, right? And I can and pull it out and say that I can the response at time k can be written in this manner, where the res where the response to the input at any time t is going to be xt times the response to having a unit input at that time. So this is the same as the one above because the equation itself is linear. There's nothing non-linear happening. Hk of x0 is going to be the same as x0 times hk of one, right? Yes, Gladys, what's the question? Why are the HK, uh, I'm talking about the second last line. Why is the HK in the first term uh, the same as the HK in the other terms? Because the other terms are talking about uh, X. So this, is, this is my notation. This is the response at time K to an input at time zero. So more generally, uh, I'm writing this as H, uh, Maybe the notation is slight, slightly confusing, but generally HK of one T is that the response at time K when I have a single input of unit value at time T and nothing else. So where the input is all zeros, a one at time T and nothing else. This is just my notation. There's another question, what is that? Um, I think I shared Gladys's question. Um, so I think the, the idea is how are we able to view the first term hk of h minus one as um, the response to an input. This is just notation. This, this, is just, this is just notation, probably a bad notation, right? But okay. this, this is literally saying the response at time t, the response at, response at time k to an input at time t. That's all it means. Right, so I, I should not view h minus one as an input? Because if it wasn't so, okay, so so this, so so this this is the response at time k. If all you had is the initial state and there was no input at all. Okay, I see. Right. Okay. So, continuing with this. Now, this is for scalars. It turns out that if the entire system were vectors, you know, this equation you get is going to be much the same. The response at time k is going to be the response or to a unit in, unit input at time minus one times the initial state plus the response to a, a vector of ones at time zero time, times the initial state and so on, right? So I can, I can still write this even for vector systems, but then let's go on and continue analyzing this. So this is the response that we got, right? At time K, it is the response to the initial state, initial value, plus the response to having just a single one at time zero plus the response to just having a single value at time one and so on all the way to the all the way to the end now let's consider just a simple the simple scalar value of this recursion it's enough for me to uh, analyze this one guy so so what i'm going to do is i don't need to analyze the response to a complete sequence as it is enough for me to analyze what happens if I just have a single input at time zero and nothing else, if the system, because if the system blows up in response to an input anywhere else, then it guaranteed is going to also blow up for the for an input right here because these these other responses are just the response to the same input shifted by one, right? So all I really need to know is does the system explode, blow up? if I have a single input at time zero and no further inputs. If it blows up in response to this, then a system is unstable, right? So 
I'm going to just look at that. So I'm going to consider a simple scalar recursion where the system is just the hidden state value is just a scalar. And so the, the recursion equation is going to be this one here. HT is uh, W times HT minus one plus C times the input at time T. And this is the recursion, except I'm specifically going to consider the case where I have a single input at time zero and no inputs anywhere else. And if you, if you look at that from this equation over here, that's simply going to be, uh, that's, I've sort of messed this up, but you can see over here that from this guy, right? That's simply going to be W raised to K times WXX zero. So in this, in this case, if you just work it out, you can see that the response at time T to having a single input at time zero is simply going to be C times X zero times W raised to T, right? This is just the response you get if you have just a single input at time zero. So is this making sense to you guys? Right? Is this making sense, this equation? Yes. Okay. Now, under what conditions for any X zero, under what conditions will the response of the system blow up? Zero. So X zero of T is the response, so Sean is a response at time T. It's a response at time T. If all I have is a single input at time zero and nothing else, right? And so when is this going to blow up? If W is greater than one, it's going, or W is less than minus one, it's going to explode. If that magnitude of W is greater than one, this is going to explode. What happens is W, if the magnitude of W is less than one? It will vanish. It's going to vanish, right? So, and that's basically what these plots show. For different values of W, the thing blows up or this just, just fades. What it doesn't do is hold the memory unless W is exactly equal to one, right? So, I can do the same thing that was for a scalar, but I can also do this for a vector. In the case of a vector, if my hidden state is a vector, this is going to be my recursion. And if I solve it, if all I have is a single input vector at time zero, then over here, uh, I'm going to say, I'm gonna find that the response at time T to a single input at time zero is simply going to be W raised to T times C times X zero. Now I can write this W weight matrix as using eigen decomposition as U lambda U inverse, right? Where U and U inverse are the, U is the matrix of eigenvectors. And the columns of U will span the space. This is the property of eigenvectors. So because the columns of U span the space, any vector at all, any vector X prime X, uh, we can write this as some, uh, some A1 times the first eigenvector plus A2 times the second eigenvector and so on. I can write this, I can write any vector in this format because the eigenvectors span the space. Now, specifically, the property is, because, because these are the eigenvectors, the, the columns of U are the eigenvectors, the property of W is that W times U is going to be lambda u. That is eigen analysis, right? And lambda is the corresponding eigenvalue. So if I've got some, if I've got some x prime, which I've expanded out in terms of the eigenvectors, if I multiply x prime by w, this is going to give me, you know, I get w x prime equals a1 times w u1 plus a2 times w u2 and so on. And we know that WU2 is simply lambda 2U2. We know that WU1 is simply lambda 1U1. So when I multiply X prime by the weights matrix, all that it's going to do is that it's going to multiply every one of these eigenvectors by the corresponding eigenvalue in this expansion. If I multiply it by W again, it's going to, this, uh, this term is going to get multiplied. The first term is going to get multiplied by lambda 1 again. This one is going to get multiplied by lambda 2 and so on. So, in, so if you look at the response after T instance, 
w raised to t times x prime. That is simply going to be a1 times lambda 1 raised to t u1 plus a2 times lambda 2 raised to t u2 and so on. So they don't have to be. These don't have to be real, but this but, but the expansion still is still, still valid, right? Because this is a standard eigen analysis. So now suppose I keep I, I, I perform this recursion. I start off with some initial x0, which I call x prime, and I keep performing this particular recursion. After time t, the recursion is going to be a hidden value, which is w raised to t times x0, right? Or x prime. So what happens as I keep expanding this particular sequence? I'm going to get each of these terms is going to be scaled by the corresponding eigenvalue raised to t. And what will happen is that because the eigenvalues are all different, or will typically all be different, eventually the largest eigenvalue will just dominate. And so at the limit, as t tends to infinity, this response w raised to t x prime is simply going to end up being a m times lambda m raised to t times u m. The rest of them are going to become insignificant and effectively not effectively vanish in comparison, where lambda m is the largest eigenvalue. So the summary of this, even if the math did not all make sense immediately to you, the summary of all of this is that if I perform this particular recursion that I have here, what will happen is that in the limit, eventually, the only term that remains is going to be the is going to be the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue multiplied by the corresponding eigenvalue raised to t. Okay, so given this, for any for 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 large t, the length of the hidden vector, this guy, the length of this vector is going to expand or contract according to the tth power of the largest eigenvalue of the recurrent weight matrix. So is this making sense, guys? Is uh, this making sense? Remind me what is what is C? Can you repeat that, Gladys? Uh, can you please remind me what is C? What is that C matrix? Which one? C over here, this guy? Yeah. It doesn't matter, right? Because the only thing that matters, I, my, my X prime over here is basically CX0. This is, the, if, if you have a recurrent network, going back into the recurrent network, the, the C is the weight of this connection. The weight matrix of that connection. Okay. Okay. And so all that matters is that for large enough t, the length of the hidden vector will expand or contract according to the tth power of the largest eigenvalue of the recurrent weight matrix. If this largest eigenvalue is greater than one, the response is going to blow up. If the largest eigenvalue is less than one, it's going to contract and shrink to zero very rapidly. And so here are some examples. Here, uh, in this case, I have uh, uh, three, uh, three instances, three different examples. The left panel, in all cases, I've started off with a sig I've uh, uh, got a single input vector, one, 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 one. Oh, come on, what's happening? I've got a single input vector, one, 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 at time zero, right? And all the other inputs are zero. So we are plotting the length of the hidden state, the length of this guy, this is the hidden state, as a function of t. Now, in this case, the weight matrix, you're looking at instances of the weight matrix where the largest eigenvalue is 0.9 and 0.5 respectively. And you can see that the length of h rapidly vanishes to zero. Now over here, I'm looking at the same thing where the largest eigenvalue of W is 1.1, and you can see that it's blowing up. And here, the largest eigenvalue is 1. It's sort of staying stable. Here again, the largest eigenvalue is 1.1. It's blowing up. For largest eigenvalue being 1, it just stays flat. 
Now there's some oscillation over here. So Igli, can you tell me why I have these oscillations? Because your values are less than one in magnitude? That's because in these two cases, the eigenvalues are complex. And so when you have complex eigenvalues, you're gonna have these oscillations. I asked you because you mentioned reals. If the eigenvalues are strictly real, you're gonna have these smooth curves. But regardless, what happens is that if the magnitude of the eigenvalues is greater than one, again, the largest eigenvalue is greater than one, it's going to blow up. If it's exactly equal to one, it's going to stay stable. If it's less than one, it's going to die down. So this is what happens with linear recursion. So uh, the uh, uh, lesson here is that in linear systems, long-term behavior depends entirely on the eigenvalues of the recurrent weights matrix. If the largest eigenvalue is greater than one, the system will blow up. If it's less than one, the response will vanish very quickly. And if you have complex eigenvalues, you can get some oscillatory response. But even here, if the magnitude of any eigenvalue is greater than one, the system will blow up. If the magnitude of all eigenvalues is less than one, it's going to go down. The key point again is that the rate at which this hidden value blows up or shrinks depends only on the eigenvalues and not on the input. The rate at which this thing blew up over here was a function only of the eigenvalue. It did not depend on the input. So if you think of the recurrent layer as holding memory, whether the memory blows up or whether the memory fades doesn't depend on what the memory is trying to remember. It only depends on the properties of the weights matrix. So is that making sense, guys? Yes, no? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, right. But this was for a linear activation. In a real, in the real world, you don't have linear activation, right? You have uh, non-linear activations like sigmas. So let's see what happens when we non when we have non-linear activations. First, I'm going to look at the case where the hidden state is a scalar, and specifically the activation is a sigmoid. So this is the relationship I have. The hidden state at time t is a sigmoid applied to w times h t minus one plus c times x t plus b. Okay, now I'm actually, I'm actually explicitly considering the bias. So again, we are considering the situation where you have a single input at time zero and no other input, and the in initial value is also zero. So there are nine figures over here. The three columns correspond to three different experiments, one in which the single hidden any single input xt at time zero was minus 0.5, where it was zero and where it was plus 0.5. These are for three different values for weights. This w, there's 1.1, 1, 1, and 0.9. And then I have five colors over here. Those five colors are for five different values of bias. And this is what happens with iterations. This is with time t. Okay. So what do you observe? In this case, after the fourth instant, after after t is safe, t is given, t is two actually, t or, or t is four. What do all the plots look like? What are the what are the right hand sides of all the plots look like? Anyone? It stagnates. They are saturated. They are all identical, are they not? If you look at the right hand side of all of these plots, or even from here. These guys are all identical, correct? Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that the actual value remembered after a few steps did not depend on x, correct? Yes or no? It doesn't depend on w either, I guess. In this case, it does not depend on w either. The only thing it depended on was what did it depend on? Bias. bias. Only the bias. Only the bias. So the uh, situation that you have over here is what the network remembers has nothing to do with what you asked it to remember. What it remembers had everything to do with just the bias. If I use a tan age, same plot, you get the same. I have three different values of x0, three different values of weight. The activation function is a tan age. You get something very similar. What, what you will observe here again is 
uh, after the 10th step, all three plots in any row are identical. If you look at any row, after the 10th step, all three plots are identical. And since the difference between the rows is only in the initial x0, this means the final value of recurrence doesn't depend on the input at all. The one difference is for bias zero, but the figures here are somewhat misleading. If you explored a bit more for bias zero, you'd find that all positive initial x values would end up at the same final value, which would be positive. All negative initial x values would end up at the same negative value. Basically, again, the actual value of the initial x has no effect on the hidden state value at all after time t equals 10. Again, now if you compare the rows, there are differences. The gap between the curves changes. So what are these gaps due to? It turns out that what the network finally remembers depends on both the bias in this case and the weight. What it doesn't depend on is x. Is this making sense to you guys? Uh, where exactly are the gaps different? Pardon me? Where exactly are the gaps different? You say the gaps are different. So these three guys, if you look at this portion, these three guys are identical. Ignore the bias zero case, right? But the, if, if you ignore the yellow line, it turns out that, that, uh, the, that the negative x and positive x behave slightly differently. But if you look at the rest of the figure, those three guys are different. Similarly, these three guys are different. I mean, these, these three guys are identical. These three guys are identical. Once you go to go past a specific time, right? So that means that what was finally stored did not depend on X. Does that make sense? Well, but, but you said like in the first, in the first row, the three are different, right? The three are different only in the initial portion. If you look at the right-hand side, they're all identical. So it actually, the initial portion, at least it depends on X. That is correct. So what happens is, unlike the sigmoid where in just two time steps, the memory is forgotten, the tan H remembers something about your input for up to time, 10 time steps, and then it forgets. What is eventually remembered is only dependent on the weights and the bias, but it does have a better short-term memory than the sigmoid. So which is why when you do recurrent neural networks, you use tan H activations because the tan H activations retain some memory of the input for up to 10 time steps. But beyond that, it's still just what is eventually remembered depends only on the parameters of the network and not on the input itself. Okay. How do you Questions? know it is 10 time steps? This is, I just looked at the plot over here. Like in 10 is, if you look at this, this is 10. If you look at the, once you get past this point, it may not be exactly 10, but the duration of the memory is quite short. All right, thank you. It's, it's longer than a sigmoid, but it's still quite sharp. If I use a ReLU, things are horrible. If the initial value is negative, the output is always going to, and, and the bias is zero, the output is going to remain zero. Otherwise, if the, uh, if the basically what you will find is that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, for positive initial values, the output blows up for W greater than one, and for w less than one and positive bias in a few steps, it just it just settles on the value of the bias. For negative initial values or negative bias, it just goes to zero and stays there. In every case, the pattern remains. The value of the recurrence either blows up or is not related to the initial x zero at all. As a memory of the past, the ReLU is completely useless. It doesn't remember anything about the input. So. Now that was for scalar recursion, where all the values were scalars. In uh, reality, our hidden recurrent state is going to be a vector with vector activations. So let's see what happens for uh, vector states with nonlinear actor activations. Here in this figure, the maximum eigenvalue for the recurrent weight matrix is 
In the upper panels, we've initialized the recursion with a vector of all ones. In the lower panels, we've initialized it with a vector of all minus ones. And uh, the bias is a scalar. So the bias is always a scalar. So we have five different values for the bias, which is shown by the five colors. The three columns are for different activations, sigmoid, tan H, and rel. Again, after about the 10th time step, which is here, the top and the bottom panels are virtually identical, which basically tells you that, that after about 10 time steps, regardless of the activation that you used, what you are trying to remember is forgotten. It doesn't even remember, right? So uh, what, do you, what you do find is that the tan H keeps the some memory about the input for a longer period than the sigmoid, which just saturates immediately. And I mean, these two might not look different, but if you look at, look at the actual values, you'll find that they're different. Uh, I mean, they might not look the same. If you look carefully at the actual values on the y-axis, you'll find that after, the, after a few time steps, these two figures are the same. Again, the ReLU is just blowing up, right? And again, the tan H is also settling to some fixed value, except that it remember, retains some memory of the input for a longer period of time. Regardless, what you're finding is that uh, for eigenvalues, when the eigenvalue is greater than one, the, uh, even if you use a nonlinear activation, what is finally remembered by the hidden state does not depend on the input. If my eigenvalue is less than one, you end up with a similar behavior again. You will find that the top and the bottom plots are the same after about the 10th time instant. The ReLU blows up, the sigmoid saturates, and the tan H saturates. But the specific place where it saturates is going to be different from when the, when the eigenvalue of W was greater than one. So what this is telling you is that what the memory of the recurrent network remembers depends only on the bias and the eigenvalues of W. It has nothing to do eventually with what it is you're trying to remember. The input that you would like it to remember is completely forgotten. So uh, we've seen the empirical results from simulations, but you could get similar results even if you did formal stability analysis. It's a bit challenging though, because we'd have to consider the convergence of lap and of functions and roots criterion and pole zero analysis. We won't do that, but to get to the bottom line, the conclusion that we will arrive at is always going to be the same. The recurrence very quickly settles on values that depend only on the parameters of the network. There's no real memory, the input is forgotten. Tan H activations hold, activations hold on to information about the input a bit longer than other activations, mainly because they're bipolar with both negative and positive outputs, but even their memory is short. So for our lessons, of all the activations, only the tan H has any semblance of memory, but it is still sensitive to the eigenvalues of the recurrent weight matrix and the bias. And even then, the best case memory is short, very short. Inputs are forgotten exponentially fast. And so the story so far is recurrent networks retain information from the infinite past in principle, in practice, they tend to blow up or forget. If the largest eigenvalue of the recurrent weights matrix is greater than one, the response network response may blow up or saturate. If it's less than one, it can die down very quickly. The memory of the network depends, depends primarily on the parameters and activation of the hidden units. Sigmoid activation saturate and the network becomes unable to retain new information. ReLU activations blow up or vanish rapidly. Tan H activations are slightly more effective at storing memory, but still not for very long. Overall, the, uh, the uh, memory behavior depends on what is remembered, depends on the parameters and not what is what you're trying to remember. So we have a whole, let's see.
both the questions are same i guess no they're not the first one is about how long it remembers the second one is about what it remembers Wait, sorry professor i thought the whole point as mentioned here of recurrent network is to retain information from infinite past but what we see here is like it just forgets maybe after 10 pass then uh then isn't it can't we achieve basically the same thing with the cnn that has with like 10 or 20 because the past information no longer matters anymore right like so we're going to answer that question in a few slides right but the first three bullets not on the only 60 of you managed to get to the poll but how long the RNN remembers memory depends on the weights of the recurrent layers and the bias and the activation function, but it doesn't depend on what you're trying to remember. What it remembers also depends on the weights, the bias and the activations, but it doesn't depend on the actual input that you're trying to remember. So basically it's failing after about 10 time instance, it's failing at the very task that it was designed for exactly as you just mentioned, right? So, Oh, sorry, uh, what's so here the it is. answer to the second uh, second poll question again? Second poll question, the first three bullets were right. And uh, the last one is wrong. It doesn't depend on the actual input you're trying to remember. Okay. So you mean both, for both questions, it's the first three that yes. are? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now, so uh, here's where we are. RNNs are models for time series analysis. They're excellent for time series prediction, classification, sequence generation. They can even simplify problems that are difficult for conventional NLPs, but the memory isn't all that great, right? I mean, if you use TANH, you can get some memory, but more generally, you know, generally, uh, the memory can be a problem, right? But then we have another problem, which is that of the vanishing gradient problem, which is not specific to recurrent networks, but happens for any deep network. A recurrent network is just a very deep network. The longest path is from the first time instant to the output at the last time. So the depth is more than the length of the input series. For any deep network, we face a very specific problem in training that of unstable estimates of the gradients or gradient descent. Now, let's see where this comes from. A multi-layer perceptron is just a nested function. We know this, right? So uh, the first layer operates on, uh, on a weighted combination of the input. I'm ignoring the bias. So the first layer outputs this. The next layer, uh, multiplies the output of the first layer by its weights and then applies an activation. The next layer multiplies the output of this one by its weights and applies an activation and so on. So the overall network is just a nested function. And then if I compute the divergence of the output with respect to the desired input, desired output, that is a function of y. And y is a nested function. So the divergence also is a nested function of this kind. So is this making sense to everyone? How that last, the, the, this one is your network and this divergence is also a nested function. Is it making sense to everyone? I'm going to be using this. So you better be very clear that what I mean. Yeah, this makes sense to me. Okay, I'm just going to assume that you got it. Okay, if you didn't, the rest of the lecture is not going to make sense to you. So now, Consider the derivative ch chain rule for any f of w times g. Now, this is a vector function. g is a vector, x is a vector, w is a matrix, f is a vector. I'm just going to use very pathetic notation and just write you know, df over dx is going to be df over dwg times dwg over dg times dg over dx. This is just the chain rule, right? Now, if I write z equals wgx, then the derivative of f with respect to x, this is more appropriate, is going to be the derivative of f with respect to its argument, wg, which is z. So it's the derivative of f with respect to z times the 
derivative of z with respect to gx, which is just w, times the derivative of g with respect to x, which is this term over here. And so this guy is the Jacobian of, this guy is the Jacobian of f with respect to z. This guy is the Jacobian of g with respect to x. So is this one making sense to God, to you? Everyone, is this clear? All right, so now when I uh, write out the derivative of the divergence with this of, so here is the divergence. Suppose I write out the derivative of the divergence with some k at layer, right? So the, so the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of the k at layer. That just using the chain rule is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to its argument. When I write something of this kind, nabla d, it means it's the derivative of d with respect to the entire term within the parenthesis. So the derivative of this divergence with respect to fk is the derivative of d with respect to its argument times the derivative of f with respect to its argument times the weight matrix times the derivative of f n minus one with respect to its argument times the next weight matrix and so on. So you're going to get basically a chain which is the derivative of the divergence times the Jacobian of the first, the output activation times the output weight matrix times the Jacobian of the penultimate activation times the penultimate weight matrix going all the way back. This is, this is what we've also, we've also seen when we were looking at back propagation, right? So all of these, all of these Jacobians are going to be matrices. All of these weights are also going to be matrices. So this is the basis. Again, is this, do you guys remember this? This has to be clear. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay. So this is derived straight from this equation over here, right? If I have f of wg, then the derivative of f with respect to x is the derivative is the Jacobian of f times w times the Jacobian of g. So that's all I've done. As the derivative of d times the Jacobian of f times the w times the Jacobian of f, fn minus one times wn minus one times the Jacobian of fn minus two and so on. That's your chain rule, okay? So I've written this out here. First, let's consider all of these Jacobians. These, uh, these are the Jacobians of the activations of the layers. Now, this, what we saw over here is valid for any, any neural network. This is nothing specific to recurrent neural networks, right? Now, in most neural networks, the hidden layers of the neural network, including for recurrent networks, generally have scalar activations. So the Jacobian matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix of this kind, where the diagonal entries are the derivatives of the activation functions being applied at the neurons. So anytime I multiply some a vector by the Jacobian matrix, the length of the vector is going to change at most by the largest derivative in the diagonal. And if the largest derivative is bounded, the length of the ve vector that is that, that you're multiplying by this Jacobian by, by this Jacobian is going to the, the, the amount by which the length changes is also going to be bounded. Now, consider your typical activation functions in any neural network. You're going to have activation functions like uh, sigmoids, tan h's, and rels. So what is the largest value that the derivative of a sigmoid can take? Anyone? What can it take? One. For sigma, it's going to be 0.25. For a tan h, it's going to be one. For a relu, it's going to be one, right? So that means these derivatives, if you're using a sigmoid, these are all guaranteed to be less than one. If you're using a tan h, there's exactly one point at which the derivative is going to be one. Everywhere else, it's going to be less than one. If you're using a relu, half the time it's going to be zero and half the time it's going to be one. So regardless, what it means is that anytime you multiply a vector by a Jacobian, 
it's almost always going to shrink the length of the vector because every component gets multiplied by a number less than one. And so uh, starting from the output layer, as you go back to the network to perform back propagation, every time you go past an activation, you're going to be multiplying by the Jacobian and the length of the derivative that you get over here is going to shrink. So uh, now what about the weights? The other term over here are the weights. The weights are going to have, I can represent any weights matrix using singular value decomposition as U S V transpose, right? Now, when I multiply any vector by W, so let's say I have a row vector, if I multiply it by W, what is the maximum by which the length of the vector is going to change? Anyone? Maximum or minimum eigenvalue. It's going to change at most by the largest eigenvalue, and it's going to shrink no lesser than the smallest eigenvalue. Specifically, if you look at the singular value directions, what is going to happen is that the components of the vector corresponding to the singular, the components of the vector that lie in the direction of the, of the singular vector corresponding to the largest singular value are going to uh, scale by that singular value. And so now, uh, if what you will find is that if you have any singular values that are greater than one, then this derivative, when you multiply it by a weight matrix, that's going to increase its in directions. It's going to expand in directions where the uh, singular values are greater than one, and it's going to shrink in directions where the singular values are less than one, right? So that happens for each of these weights matrices. So as I keep going backwards through the net and keep multiplying by these weights matrices, the uh, uh, chain product will expand the derivative in directions where each stage has singular values greater than one, and it's going to shrink it in directions where each stage has singular values less than one. And as a result of this, when we propagate the gradient back from the output layer into the net for deep networks, as we go further and further back, the derivatives is going to, now one of the properties of any weights matrix is that you're going to have a small number of large singular values and the majority of the singular values are going to be very small. That's just a property of matrices. So what will happen is that as you, as you move the derivatives back through the net, the derivatives are going to begin expanding in directions where uh, the, uh, the uh, singular values are greater than one, which are going to be a very small number of directions and they're going to blow up in those directions. And in the other directions, the derivative is simply going to go to zero. So as a result, you have this property where some, some in some directions, in some components, the derivative is going to shrink. In the other components, in, and in a small number of directions, it's going to blow up. And the entire gradient computation operation becomes unstable. So here, is, here are some visualizations of what actually happens. This is for A. 19 layer MNIST model. The figure shows the magnitude of the derivatives for the activations at each layer for a bad, for you know, the average across a batch of inputs. Now the neurons are laid out horizontally over here and the layers are laid out vertically. So the output layer is at the bottom, the input layer is at the top. And here we've computed the derivatives for the activations and, and we've plotted the magnitude and we've done this at initialization. So uh, the, uh, and remember you're performing gradient descent. So you're going to get the largest derivatives at initialization. Afterwards, the derivatives are going to go get smaller. And here specifically you're using ELO activations. And what you observe is that as you go, as you propagate the derivatives back from the input to output towards the input, the derivatives get smaller and smaller. And after about the eighth layer, basically, the derivatives just vanish. In fact, they don't all vanish. There's going to be a very tiny subset for which the derivatives are, derivatives are very, very large, but you can't actually see them in the visualization. What is apparent is that after just a few layers backwards through the network, 
all of the derivatives, almost all of the derivatives have vanished. If I use the ReLU activation, you get exactly the same kind of behavior. In fact, the derivatives you will see if you compare the ReLU with the ELU is that the derivatives vanish even more quickly than for the ELU. This is with a sigmoid. The derivatives vanish, derivatives vanish even faster with a sigmoid than for a ReLU. This is for a tan H. These are slightly better than sigmoids, but they too vanish. In fact, of all of the activations that we saw, only the ELU holds the uh, derivatives for the longest depth. Now, all of these examples are the average derivative over a batch. But then if I look at individual training instances, what happens? These are nine individual training instances for which I'm plotting the magnitude of the derivative for at, at, of the, at every neuron. And once again, you can see that for every one of these uh, instances, I'm using the ELO activation, the ELO where the derivatives maintain their value for the longest step. And you can see that in every one of these, the derivatives vanish after just a few minutes. So overall, we find that while the ELO activations may hold the derivative magnitudes longest, in all cases, the derivatives effectively vanish after about 10 layers, both for when you, when you compute the average derivative across batches, or if you consider individual instances. And in fact, they won't all vanish. You're going to have a very tiny number of components corresponding to directions where of the weights matrix where the singular values are larger than one, which are gonna blow up, but the rest of them are just going to go to zero. And so the uh, story so far is that recurrent networks retain information from the infinite past in principle. In practice, they are poor at memorization. The hidden outputs can blow up or shrink to zero depending on the eigenvalues of the recurrent weight matrix. This is in the forward pass. And so also, and the memory is a function of the activation of the hidden units. Tan H activations are are most effective at retaining memory, but overall, after just a few steps, what is remembered has nothing to do with uh, what you're trying to remember. And how long you can remember it also has nothing to do with what you're trying to remember. Deep networks also suffer from the vanishing or exploding gradient problem, where the gradient of the error at the output gets concentrated into a small number of parameters in the earlier layers and goes to zero for others. And now that's for any network, but as it happens, recurrent networks are really very deep nets. And so uh, the relationship between an, the initial value of X and the final output is given by this chain of connections. And you can see that it's very deep. What this means is that gradients for divergences at the final time step will vanish by the time they're propagated to t equals zero. We're gonna have severe vanishing gradient problems or exploding gradient problems. Now, although I've been focusing on what happens during back propagation in the past few minutes, we've already seen that, in fact, back prop is just a mirror of forward computation. Stuff gets forgotten in the forward pass because each activation and weights matrix is going to sort of shrink the input or blow it up. And stuff gets, oh, stuff gets uh, and the derivatives get uh, lost in the backward parts. So what this means is that the network as we just saw it is neither good at remembering information for very long, nor is it actually able to use information from the future to update the parameters now because the memory doesn't hold for very long going forwards and the derivatives simply disappear or blow up going backwards. So any questions so far? Questions, anyone? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then if they're so bad in remembering and uh, like, back propagating, how are they performing so well? Like, we're gonna get to that, them? okay. Because you don't use RNNs in their basic form at all. They're not good. 
okay? Because here is the property we want. We want things to be remembered. And furthermore, some things are more important than others and we want the memory to be selective. For instance, when we looked at the Linux code generation problem earlier, if you generated an open brace, you had to remember it as long as you had to, you had to remember it until it was closed. Then you could forget it. Or if you, if you were using a recurrent network to parse code, if you encountered an open brace, you had to remember that the brace is open and you had to hold that memory till that specific brace was closed and then you had to shut it. And so, uh, and the duration for which you had to hold it depend, could be arbitrary, right? Also, or consider this text example. Uh, Jane had a quick lunch in the bistro, then she. The last word is she, not he. So this relates to the word Jane that occurred many words ago. So the net must remember Jane for as long as it takes in order to, for it to make sense of the she. On the other hand, what is remembered, you know, all must also depend on, on the input, right? Not everything is equally important. The word A over here is not that important or the word N, it's not important to remember those for very long periods of time. A, a in particular is just an article. Even if you made a mistake, it's not going to change the overall sense. You don't really want to remember it, right? So we want the net to remember inputs for arbitrary long, arbitrarily long, and the memory must depend on what is being remembered. But regular RNNs don't have this property. They don't remember for too long, and how long they remember anything depends on the weights and on the parameters and not the content that you're trying to remember. And so to solve that, we enter the domain of magic and mystery. But before that, I'm going to uh, have one more. Be quick with this, guys. It's a long question, but. Fifteen seconds, guys. So, actually, I'll give you a thirty seconds. stop this and share the results. All of these are true, right? Every one of these statements is true. Now let's go back and see what really happened over here. We saw that how long the network remains any, retains any memory depends on only on these underlying terms, the weights of the network and the activation rather than what it's trying to remember. Now, instead of having a network of this kind, can we have a network that remembers arbitrarily long to be recalled on demand? A network where how long something is remembered is not a function of network parameters, but rather than on some input-based determination of whether it is worthy of being remembered. So for an analysis, for instance, if you're analyzing a C program, when we encounter an open brace, we would like the model to remember that the fact that it has encountered an open brace until it encounters a closed brace at the right level at which forgot point it can forget about it. And this memory behavior should not depend on network parameters. It should depend on what's the, on what is being remembered. So what for this, what we want to do is, again, these Ws are a problem, right? These Ws cause things to blow up or Explorer or, or, or shrink, 
Let's get rid of it. These Fs are a problem. They cause vectors to shrink or explode or saturate. Let's get rid of that. So what happens then? Instead, we're going to end up with a structure of this kind where you, you compute some function of the input that is worthy of the membrane. And then subsequently at each time, you analyze the input that comes in. And based on an analysis of the input, you decide whether this thing must be continued to be held in memory or not. So these are all multiplicative factors or they could be additive, which will add, subtract, scale up or scale down the memory based only on the input, but there are no explicit activations or weights that will modify the memory. So now the memory is being modified only by some switches that are operating on the input that decide whether the memory is worth retaining or not. And so that gives us the structure. So I have a quick question. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think about two slides back, there was a term I didn't quite understand, a multi-tap rec recursion. Which um, one? Before, the, before the, the mystery and magic slide. Yeah, yeah. something about can be performed with multi-tap rec recursion. I didn't, I'm not familiar with that. So, this one. So basically multi-tapping, it's on the slides. What you can do is instead of having something of this kind, I can also have explicit links going back, right? And so okay. the recursion. And so, so that's and something that's, like the escape steps in a, in a ResNet. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Okay. And that's going to increase the amount for, to which, the depth to which you can, uh, you know, the amount of time to, for which you can remember stuff, but it makes things more complex, right? Okay. Instead, we're going to Thanks. have this structure, something called the constant error corrosion. This history T, which has been computed from the input, is just carried through over here, uncompressed by weights or unmodified by activations. Instead, at each time, it's multiplied by a gate sigma that modifies the memory as appropriate. I'm only showing a single line over here, but this is actually going to be a bank of lines. Remember this, the block figure I showed? You're gonna have a bank of lines, each of which is carrying some, some bit of memory. And all of these, the bank of lines is going into the slide and all of these are being carried forward. And at each time you have these gates which analyze the input and, and based on what they see in the input, they can modify what's in memory. So this is what we call the constant error carousal. The constant error carousal just holds the memory and it has no non-linearities of its own. The actual nonlinear work is done by other portions of the network. Neurons that compute a workable state from the memory. Now, what about this gate? To decide if a memory must be modified, this gate must consider the current input, right? But it must not only consider the current input, it must also uh, it must also consider what is already in memory. So, for example, to decide to 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 forget an open brace, the gate must also know that the brace is open, and that a closed. So, it must know that a brace is open, and that a closed brace closed brace has been encountered. So, it has to it has to consider both before it decides whether to modify this memory. But then that's, that's all, not all that's required. You also want to consider other context terms that may be useful to detect the relevant patterns required to modify the memory, including, for instance, what is in the raw memory itself through this direct connection, which we like to call the people connection. So this structure, this entire structure that we see over here is the basis for a model called the long short-term memory network or LSTM. The idea here is that if the memory of these networks is going to be held by lines that are not influenced by weights, matrices, or activations, things which will uh, modify what's in the memory based only on, that, on the properties of the parameters or the functions and not based on what is being held at all. And instead you replace it by the structure where the memory is going to go through unchallenged unless you get an external cue that explicitly states, this can be forgotten, this must be incremented or whatever else. 
right? So is this making sense? Yes or no, guys? I don't see any responses, but do you see how this actually, this structure addresses the problems that we just saw with your regular uh, recurrent networks. This is the long short term, short term memory, which explicitly latches information to prevent decay or blow up in what is being remembered. So I'll stop the class right here with one final call. And I think we can select only one in this while the so I think I, I set up the uh, the poll wrongly, but we'll still see. Okay. I'll wait for everybody to respond. So Manish, how does this how, how does it train? We're going to talk about this in the next class. But then what are the parameters of this network? It doesn't have weights, it doesn't have activation. What does it have? Memory. But it has something else. It has the gates which right. decide when it must be switched on or off, right? So you can train the parameters of these gates. And why is it that 30 people have not bothered to answer the poll? Some of you just have your cameras on and have left. Right. That's a waste of your time and mine. You might as well not be in class. All of these are right. Okay. So let's stop the recording right here.